<laughs> you just presented a cardiology grand rounds to a group of uh, clinicians, residents, cardiology fellows, a variety of researchers, PhD researchers, on a topic uh, that today has become uh, a major uh, interest and health issue. That is uh, diabetes, glucose handling, and insulin resistance. To an endocrinologist, insulin resistance usually is a red flag. You're communicating a different message here that it may be protective to the heart. So uh, this didn't just begin today, though. I just happened to uh, have this article <laughs> that was published 40-some years ago by Heinrich Techmeyer, Reginald Helms, and Hans Kretz on uh, uh, isolated beating heart. Uh, and uh, this was at Oxford, looking at alternate fuels and showing that insulin was not necessarily required for glucose utilization of the heart. So this is an issue I see spanning many years. In your trajectory of how you got to this point of the, the clinical, the bench, the people you've trained, these topics that are so relevant today, could, could trainees today uh, follow that sort of track? Or, or are those paths available to trainees today? Very, uh, very good question. And I'd like to start out with my own experience. Um, I realize you're now a cardiologist, and I have a good fortune to be trained well in cardiology, and I also had the good fortune to be trained well in metabolic biochemistry. And how this happened, I really don't know. It was certainly not a revelation. It was um, the excitement uh, that I felt when I started medical school. Um, excitement with biology, which went you know, back to my high school years. And um, the opportunity to f follow my own star and that somehow uh, includes taking care of patients and working at very um, fundamental problems in the lab. And I've been very fortunate that I've, I've been able to do this now for almost 50 years. It's not was I its challenges and um, perhaps a bit of the beaten track. But academic medicine traditional has been very strong in supporting investigators who are equally at home at the bedside and in the laboratory. The uh, culture in academic medicine is changing somewhat, but uh, eventually I think it will all come back to this very um, uh, essence, and that is uh, progress through research, which often raises more questions rather than finding answers to and um, at the same time provide the best possible care to our patients. Technology helps. Technology has helped in my field in cardiology, tremendously cardiology has undergone um, complete 
change in um, approach and management, for instance, in acute myocardial infarction, but also in valvular heart disease, in um, arrhythmias, and in uh, heart failure, heart failure, cyst devices and transplants. But we're still uh, far away from cure for heart disease, just as far as we are away from cure for diabetes and cure for cancer. And not to speak of neurodegenerative diseases and um, some of the uh, inherited uh, disorders, inherited disorders of metabolism, uh, as an example, uh, rare diseases or infrequent diseases like mitochondrial myopathies, all challenges that have, have not been possible to, to solve and uh, there will be as long as human beings are alive new challenges all the time. <coughs> Constantly. In, in your uh, lecture today, uh, you mentioned uh, Langerhan, Paul Langerhan, uh, as a medical student, now discovered the islets of what we call now today islets of Langerhan, Bantine and Best. Uh, Best being a medical student, Bantine a scientist, working together the discovery of insulin. I mean, these are not uh, minor things. In probably one of your most cited papers, uh, uh, done by a cardiologist who worked for a number of years, or worked in your lab anyway, and has since though so, uh, he's in a private practice of cardiology now. But his his approach to cardiology is, is probably different than somebody that had no exposure to data collection, data analysis, to trying to develop a narrative about what they're seeing and explaining it to people. I think this might be missing today. I mean, do you do you see that path of uh, tra people in training having a significant amount of time to spend data collect, be it clinical or bench? data collection, thinking about things, uh, rather than, you know, <laughs> Googling it or, yeah. or filling out checklists on forms. I mean, today it's become, the process of it becomes so time consuming. You are, you are so correct. Well, I think the excitement is in the discovery to discover something new and using the tools of molecular biology, imaging, and um, physiology that we have today to discover new concept. Uh, just as much as our uh, ancestors in research have done this, and they have done it um, quite effectively on the foundation of clinical medicine. I like to quote example, Krebs was a clinician, Warburg was a clinician, Warburg known today more than at any time before because of the Warburg effect in cancer cell metabolism, Krebs for the urea cycle and the citric acid cycle, or Krebs worked with, always with a student, his papers were two author papers, the second author is a student. And ironically, the urea cycle paper was um, written with Hanselite, and the Krebs Hanselite solution is still today the standard <coughs> bicarbonate buffer because it mimics the uh, extracellular milieu, iron, iron composition. But ironically, um, Hanselite uh, left, left research in science after he graduated from medical school. He trained as a urologist. 
But some of the, you know, best was Bantic's student, and he played a, a pivotal role in the um, discovery of insulin. And, uh, and, and it was best and Bantic, the interaction between uh, the, the teacher and his student that got the whole project you know, going. And I, uh, yeah, I go on later in the 1940s, it was this, the discovery of the antibiotics, uh, again by physicians. And the principle that um, there is a um, biological compound that can destroy microorganisms without any ill effects on the host organ very important principle, life-saving for millions of people that started in the laboratory and uh, was then translated into clinical practice. Now, of course, the clinical problem that is sepsis, the overwhelming infection that killed people, um, contagious diseases or avoid um, infection before the advent of antibiotics was recognized as a clinical problem. The micro the bacteria, the microorganisms were known as disease causing. Robert Koch, Koch's postulates formed the foundation, the framework for the eventual development of the antibiotics and in between is called Ehrlich and, um, and the magic bullet hypothesis that there, somehow in nature or in chemistry there is a magic substance that kills bacteria that not the, uh, the host organism concept gradually evolved until a chance observation met another person's prepared mind. And this was Fleming and then Howard Floyd and um, Ernest Chain. And, um, they then went on to revolutionize certain part of medicine. And this is the interplay between basic research and, and clinical medicine, starting with a clinical problem, taking it to a testable uh, laboratory setting, and then bringing it back to the clinical setting, um, benefiting, benefiting countless patients. This interplay <coughs> seems to be under tremendous stress. There, there's a big space developing yeah, between these highly skilled trained PhDs in the lab that are very interested in clinical problem, but there's virtually no reaction or very little reaction with clinical people. Then they'll be working on a protein or a gene or this and that and different models. On the other hand, they're highly skilled clinical people that are almost divorced anymore from uh, uh, developing hypotheses and testing them, but now having to meet all these uh, requirements for the way medicine is practiced today. So you know, a big gap is developing here, and I, I just don't know if institutionally something should be done to get them. I hate to use the word protected time, that's an old term, but time where there can't be some sort of interreact, meaningful interreaction. Yeah. You're, you're right, you're pointing to an important problem and a challenge. I think um, as long as there are patients, there will be questions 
that can only be addressed in a controlled laboratory setting. And the, the uh, challenge is to create the right environment or to maintain the right environment. And the law, it takes a lot of different people and different skills. Allow people to interact, to foster the interaction of people was maybe in a somewhat structured way, but also informally. And inf informal interaction is, is even more important than formal interaction. We have our scientific meetings where we uh, entertain each, others, each other with um, our latest research results and we talk and during the breaks and we uh, um, have intense discussion at, discussions at times, but equally important is to sit over a cup of coffee or to um, meet with people without any special intent sometimes and then the end of the, in the end of the 15 minutes or half an hour that you talked, some brilliant ideas yeah. have sprung to mind in maybe even not a collaboration is starting. It's yeah. an important collaboration. This seems this seems like it's evaporating today. Yeah. It, uh, it's hard to organize. It's hard to organize, except wise institutions like yours provide space for informal interactions and thoughtful people make use of them. Now, I think a conference room like this here is a good example, you know, this is just enough room for members of two labs to get together and to share some results and to discuss possible strategies. Um, the Texas Medical Center is a, a wonderful place to interact because all the institutions are within walking distance or only a short distance away. And uh, we have many shared interests in metabolism, for instance, with people from different disciplines. Heart disease is one, diabetes is another one. <coughs> cancer, cancer cell metabolism is uh, yeah, now at the level that the Anderson has started a uh, cancer metabolism discussion group that meets every Wednesday. It's amazing where people come from all of a sudden. There is so much mm -hmm. interest in this. And we also, of course, need interaction with people who can help um, us interpreting results and how to deal with masses of data, big data management is a um, big challenge for us. Um, I see uh, in the ideal world a, uh, an interplay between discovery-driven um, analytical research and hypothesis-driven problem-solving research. Um, it's hard to separate the two, but um, an example is um, um, computational modeling is a uh, approach to uh, test hypothesis before you do the experiment and see then if your hypothesis is correct with follow-up experiments. And 
in silica. From, yeah, in silica, yeah, right. <laughs> in silica, that's the, uh, yeah, yeah, it's that's silica, silica. Yeah. Yes. That, that is the uh, technical <laughs> term. Yeah. I sense uh, hope <laughs> and positivism in, in your view, especially in a center like the medical center. People coming together, and uh, just on the clinical side, I worry that some of them undervalue the experience of this sort of analysis and the hypothesis-driven work, even even in small projects, what it can bring to their approach to the broader field of yeah. clinical. But I, I'm sensing hope in what you're saying here. Well, you are very correct. I think it takes really, but as you say not a village, but 10,000 villages to um, keep the entire um, enterprise alive and m make it meaningful. I think well, the practice of medicine, including academic medicine, has um, oriented itself more and more now to the corporate model of efficiency, action items, action points, mm -hmm. and uh, measurable <coughs> quantities. In science, of course, all our work is measuring, but there is a certain amount of creativity. In our, um, you know, fiscal prosperity is largely determined by and support we get for our ideas, and our research ideas, our research proposals, successful research proposals. In clinical medicine, it's different. In clinical medicine, there's number of procedures you do, number of patients you see. Um, uh, the, uh, the number of tests you interpret, that's all, you know, quantifiable and can be turned into... Not, not how you interpret it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's the number. The number yeah, that's a whole interpret. different concept. Yeah. Yeah. And of it's course, there is always day. that has resulted then in a new specialty that oversees this a little bit and quality assurance. And there's a lot of talk about quality assurance, but the reality is the bottom line is the quantity. It's very similar with education and, and medical education is also more and more quantitative actually. It's, it's you know, the scores, the test scores and passing tests and preparing for tests and it's all well worked out in medical education, but the linking you know, education with patient care and linking education with research remains a big challenge. So we can be very successful by numbers in patient care, very successful by numbers in students passing exams because they're fantastic educational tools. The question is if we are preparing the next generation of critical biomedical researchers at the same time. Research has become more and more the um, can't say playground, but the, the realm of specialists, you know, who are trained in something very <coughs> specific. And I, uh, I like to say to our students, and they sometimes don't like to hear it, that it's not so difficult to be number one in the world in a very small area, right? You know everything in a very, very, very small area. But that doesn't help you much further if you don't see 
the, the broad picture if you can't see the broad picture. And um, I think it's also a bit of a matter of an attitude if you have the ability to step back and the ability to to help other people and without expecting anything in return. And that sometimes I feel that this, this culture is uh, being forgotten in the uh, more, I'd say, quantitative approach on how many tests have you read, how many procedures have you done, how many patients have you seen, how many um, grant proposals have you written, mm -hmm. Things you can quantitate how many students have check been, uh, have passed their exams. And so it's a bit complex. But that's life, I guess. It's life. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we really appreciate your talk this morning, especially uh, addressing the heart as an endocrine organ. Yes. Maybe right. in an endocrinologist, not a cardiologist. Yes, right. But seeing the broader picture and that, the, the view that insulin resistance actually may be protective, just something that doesn't come to mind right away. It makes people think. And I, your, your presentation was very well uh, received. And I, Appreciate you coming thank over and giving us this talk. Thank you very much. It is always a challenge to make make yourself and others think. Yes. Stop and think. <laughs> You're doing that. Stop and think. But that is <clears throat> no excuse for um, inaction. You have to think and come to a conclusion. Yeah, at well, some point, see, at, at some, some point, point, you have to decide. Right. And at some point, you know, the ships come yes. down. I sense hope in what you're talking about, yeah. though. I appreciate your coming. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much for having me.